The number was circled in a black marker. I wadded up the paper and threw it away, then flopped down in my bunk in the middle of the empty cabin. Lights out, I told myself miserably. That night, I had the worst dream yet. I was running along the beach in a storm. This time, there was an empty city behind me. Not New York. The sprawl was different. Buildings spread farther apart, palm trees and low hills in the distance. About a hundred yards down the surf, two men were fighting. They looked like TV wrestlers, muscular, with beards and long hair. Both wore flowing Greek tunics, one trimmed in blue, the other in green. They grappled with each other, wrestled, kicked, and headbutted, and every time they connected, lightning flashed and the sky grew darker and the wind rose. I had to stop them. I didn't know why. But the harder I ran, the more wind blew me back until I was running in place. My heels were digging uselessly in the sand. Over the roar of the storm, I could hear the blue road one yelling at the green road one, Give it back! Give it back! Like a kindergartner fighting over a toy. The waves got bigger, crashing on the beach, spraying me with salt. I yelled, Stop it! Stop fighting! The ground shook. Laughter came from somewhere under the earth, and a voice so deep and evil it turned my blood into ice. Come down, little hero, the voice crooned. Come down. The sand split beneath me, opening a crevice straight down to the center of the earth. My feet slipped, and darkness swallowed me. I woke up, sure I was falling. I sat in bed in cabin three. My body told me it was morning, but it was stark outside. The thunder rolled across the hills. A storm was brewing. I hadn't dreamed that. I heard a clopping sound at the door, a hoof knocking on the threshold. Come in. Grover trotted inside, looking worried. Mr. D wants to see you. Why? He wants to kill, I mean, I'd better let him tell you. Nervously, I got dressed and followed, sure I was in big trouble. For days, I'd been half expecting a summons to the big house. Now that I was declared a son of Poseidon, one of the big three gods who weren't supposed to have kids, I figured it was a crime for me just to be alive. The other gods had probably been debating the best way to punish me for existing. And now, Mr. D was ready to deliver the verdict. Over Long Island Sound, the sky looked like ink soup coming to a boil. A hazy curtain of rain was coming in our direction. I asked Grover if we needed an umbrella. No, he said. It never rains here unless we want it to. I pointed at the storm. What the heck is that, then? He glanced uneasily at the sky. It'll pass around. Bad weather always does. I realized he was right. In the week I'd been here, it had never been overcast. The few rain clouds that I'd seen skidded right around the edges of the valley. But this storm, this was a huge one. At the volleyball pit, the kids from Apollo's cabin were playing a morning game against the satires. Dionysus' twins were walking around the strawberry fields, making the plants grow. Everybody was going about their normal business, but they looked tense. They kept their eyes on the storm. Grover and I walked up to the front porch of the big house. Dionysus sat at the pinny knuckle table in his tiger-striped Hawaiian shirt. His Diet Coke can, just as he had on the first day. Chiron sat across from the table, in his fake wheelchair. They were playing against invisible opponents, two sets of cards hovering in the air. Well, well, Mr. G said without looking up. Our little celebrity, I waited. Come closer, Mr. D said, and don't expect me to no-tell you, mortal, just because old Barnacle Beard is your father. A net of lightning flashed across the clouds. Thunder shook the windows of the house. Blah, 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 Dionysus said. Chiron feigned interest in the pinochle cards. Grover cowered by the railing, his hooves clopping back and forth. If I had my way, Dionysus said, I would cause your molecules to erupt in flames. We'd sweep up the ashes and be done with this lot of trouble. But Chiron seems to feel this would be against my mission and this cursed camp to keep your little brat safe from harm. Spontaneous combustion is a form of harm, Mr. D, Chiron put in. Nonsense, Dionysus said. Boy wouldn't feel a thing. Nevertheless, I've agreed to restrain myself. I'm thinking of turning you into a dolphin instead and sending you back to your father. Mr. D, Chiron warned. Oh, all right, Dionysus relented. There's one more option, but it's deadly foolishness. Dionysus rose and the invisible player's cards dropped to the table. I'm off to Olympus for the emergency meeting. If the boy is still here when I get back, I'll turn him into an Atlantic bottlenose. Do you understand? And Perseus Jackson, if you're at all smart, you'll see that's much more a sensible choice than what Chiron feels you must do. Dionysus picked up a playing card, twisted it, and it became a plastic rectangle. A credit card? 
No, a security pass. He snapped his fingers. 